So today from our physical health department, we are very fortunate to have orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Anthony Romeo, who will speak to us about scapular fixation surgery. Hey June, would you wanna introduce Dr. Romeo for us? Yes, so Dr. Romeo uh, has, is well known to the FSHD community. Um, he is one of the top surgeons uh, pra uh, practicing this procedure of scapular stabilization. But beyond that, he is one of the top orthopedic surgeons, uh, especially specializing in upper limb, shoulder, you know, elbow surgery in the country. Uh, he has been, I think, a team surgeon for some of Chicago's uh, professional sports teams. And he practiced for many years in Chicago, and then he moved to New York City a few years ago. But now, fresh, hot off the press, he's back in Chicago uh, at the DuPage Medical Group. Uh, I believe, I, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, right. kind of leading a multidisciplinary team, uh, you know, focused on elbow, shoulder uh, medicine and neuromuscular conditions where, where various interventions are required. So we'd, we'd be curious to hear more about that because I think that would be of great interest to our, our you know, our community in the Chicago area. But um, so I don't have much more to say except you are the man. <laughs> so I turn off, turn on the uh, microphone for you. Uh, thank you very much. And so I'm gonna share my screen um, so that we have, um, uh, so I, I think I just need June to, uh, uh, to let that go and then I can okay, let's and share, see. perfect, beautiful. Yes. And then I have set and then I will put it in the right uh, projection mode here. Um, and that's the end of the talk. So we don't wanna go there, we'll go to the beginning. So there we are. Hello everyone. It's a great opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I was asked to present where we are at with regards to scapular thoracic state. about me, I trained at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I learned how to do perform the procedure, the scapular thoracic fusion, um, and that was more than 25 years ago. I then went to Rush University in Chicago, and there was a very well-known doctor there who did both orthopedics and neurology, uh, Dr. Irwin C. Thoracic Fusion with another doctor when they were at Loyola, Dr. Wilton Bunch, and presented the results and the session. Uh, Dr. Siegel uh, and I met, and after a, a couple of cases where we were together, uh, uh, he said uh, that he was happy to hand these over to me, and we proceeded with trying our best to do this operation as well as possible. The operation is not that much different than it was 25 years ago. There are new or devices to work on fixing the bone down to the, the ribs, the scapula to the ribs, and I'll discuss that briefly. Um, and we'll go over the indications. I was at a, a program in New York, but I was recruited to come back to Chicago to put together the Musculoskeletal Institute at DuPage Medical Group, which is the largest private practice group in the state of Illinois and very large for this area of the Midwest with uh, over 900, excuse me, over 800 physicians. And our practice will have about 80 providers. I will still be practicing shoulder and elbow surgery and sports medicine care. And I have a particular interest in managing the more complex problems, including those related to uh, the condition of FSHD. And so I uh, will be happy to answer your questions and be a resource for you uh, and help you find the care that you would like. I gave this presentation um, a little over a year ago. I was invited by the New York chapter uh, and presented the information. So uh, not much has changed if you go through the literature in the last year. Uh, some of you may have heard about a little of this, but I hope to just update this a little bit, but uh, we really are fairly stable in terms of what we're doing for this. I think you're all very well aware of the importance of the FSHD Society 
And every time a patient contacts my office, I always ask them, are you connected online with the FSHD Society? You can see by the timeline, the incredible advancements and contributions that have been made uh, because of the society. The societies are always improved by the engagement and participation of the members. And so I think it's very important, especially now with some of the incredible advances that are occurring with regards to the management of genetic disorders uh, that uh, support those affected by this condition, be involved with the society as a very strong uh, advocacy group, as a very strong educational component uh, like the one today. So I can't say enough about how valuable this is as a resource uh, for everyone that wants to know about FSHD. Um, again, uh, I initially did this and, and it was uh, really, and my practice has been as the director of shoulder and elbow and sports medicine. Uh, it's mostly shoulder, some elbow, that's just the nature of the condition. Uh, but I've always been the person that does the complex or revision cases. And these types of cases where the scapula is unstable, and there has to be an exposure of the ribs and you're close to the lungs is something that uh, the vast majority of orthopedic surgeons have actually not even seen. And those that have say, oh, I think I would rather you do that operation uh, because they get a little nervous about some of the anatomy. And as you can see in the lower picture there is an example of a young man with FSHD during his teenage years with bilateral scapular instability and his ability to raise his arms above the shoulder level is quite limited. What is the overall purpose of the shoulder? The overall purpose of the shoulder is to position the hand in space. What we can do with our upper extremity, our arm, is related to what our hand does. And if you can't get your hand into the right position, it really can be a very limiting in how well the arm works. And that's why uh, when you start to lose the ability to use your arm for Mises, we're all very well aware of what uh, this uh, uh, terminology is. It's a descriptive terminology, fascio. It describes actually the muscles around the face. And so you've seen the typical pattern when someone tries to uh, have a big smile and it's uh, difficult for those muscles to uh, bring the smile wide open. Uh, the scapula gets affected and it's particularly the muscles called the serratus anterior. That is a muscle we'll show you later where it attaches to the ribs and pulls the scapula against the chest wall. So when you raise up your arm, you have the ability to do that. And it affects the muscles around the upper part of the arm. As life goes on, and as you know, there's quite a difference in terms of the way that it actually affects many people. It can get into the torso or the mid portion of the body and the lower limbs. And so um, there's been some suggestion, a third or more, uh, will need significant support for ambulation by the time they're around 50 years old uh, with this condition. Importantly, it's associated with a normal lifespan and normal intelligence. And in my experience has been dealing with the people, it actually seems like and it's a higher intelligence to the average community for sure. There's a lot of incredibly bright people um, that uh, have this condition or are family members of this condition, uh, which is uh, helpful when you're trying to care for them because there is some education that's involved. It was first described uh, really many, many years ago. Many people thought it was the third most common muscular dystrophy. The most common one I've been Duchenne's and Becker's muscular dystrophy, different mechanism genetically, but actually some of the most recent studies, particularly from Europe, where they are able to do it in socialized countries so they can get everybody, you have an ID number, and so they can scan a large group of people and have a better sense of these conditions or the presence. And actually it's having a thing is higher than even the most common. So I think it's more uh, many people, it's just that there's a people who have the genetic component of this, yet it doesn't really express itself uh, that significantly. It may be little findings or it may be just a small amount of weakness in their upper body or other things like that. Uh, but then like this young man here, there are a number of them who of course get more severe conditions and that really affects what they can do with it. 
the genetics have been fairly well worked out. And this is helpful because this will really guide us in terms of the indication for the genetic therapies certainly coming in the very future. It's really remarkable what big science on in an effort to uh, accomplish uh, this uh, ability to see um, what's going on in terms of, the, of this. So it's, uh, it's really remarkable. And, and you can see that if you have it, there's about a 50% chance your child will have it. Uh, but there's a 50% chance they'll be unaffected. The most commonly affected muscles, as I mentioned, the face, the area around the shoulder blade and the upper arms, and oftentimes the weakness is asymmetrical. It affects one side. We hear lots of stories about uh, teenagers who were treated for uh, their arm not working so well for a long time, two, three years, and then the other arm and then a light bulb goes off and they say you know what this may be something else it's quite different than that uh, the other thing that's uh, quite remarkable about this is that it, it can be subtle enough i've had patients sadly who have been treated for five ten years uh, for weakness in their shoulders they've had physical therapy athletic trainers and lots of care uh, and it just never really clicks. And then finally, I've had the chance to see them and say, there's really only one condition that gives you this significant bilateral scapular winging without any specific trauma. And we send them off for a genetic test and they find out many years later after being very frustrated uh, with physical therapy and care that in fact, they had a condition that- Up to the ceiling. So this is a young man that, excuse me, we'll go back. So this is a young man that we did. Uh, this is what it presents like, as we see here. So go ahead and raise your arms up to the ceiling. Okay, and let it, and let it slowly come back down. Okay, now can you go uh, both arms out away from your sides, like a, like a bird kind of, like going in that direction? So you see okay, his, his right side is effective now, on this left. Can you put both your hands up against the wall? And, 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 yeah, and then push really hard. And this young man okay. has given me permission Try to, to hold show his videos. Place together if you can. Okay, and then let it relax. Okay, good. Go ahead and raise your arms up to the ceiling. So remarkably, this man, sir, and then the last couple of years, because he in his right arm and he was and he did, in fact, we diagnosed him in his mid twenties as having FSD. This muscle, the ribs, or usually can go three to eight, and it attaches onto the scapula. And this is how this works: the ribs uh, being intact. It goes on of the scapula, as you see right here. So there's really uh, three different segments to it, but the entire muscle is affected. This is again the serratus anterior. This is an amazing animation from uh, the anatomy uh, department in Lyon, France. And so when you go to raise up your arm, that muscle pulls on the scapula against your chest wall, which allows you to raise your arm up higher. If it doesn't pull the wings out the back, and so you can't get your arm up any higher. And so that's really the, what makes a difference. Those muscles between the ribs are called the intercostals and they're generally normal. The muscle on the undersurface subscapularis. And unfortunately, we do have to remove a little of that to get the bone down to the bone of the could be right in between the two unless we get those out of it. The motion of the shoulder is the ball and socket joint, which is the glenohumeral joint. And if we say it's 180 degrees, the glenohumeral, the scapular thoracic joint has about 25% or more. And so if that's not working well, again, you can get your arm up halfway, but not much higher. And then you bend your spine to get the final amount of that. And then again, the ability to raise up your arm is related to these different areas of the shoulder. And it's very important to understand wh why does this cause a problem? Well, think of this metaphor. If you're standing on the ground and you go to pick up something that's really heavy, you stabilize your, your feet and your legs and you can pick up with maximum strength. Now you stand on a skateboard and you try to pick up the same object, you can't do it. And it's because you are spending all of your energy trying to stabilize your core so that the normal muscles of your shoulders and arms can pick up the object. Well, that's what happens with this condition is that the scapula is not stable. 
And so the regular muscles of the shoulder, like the rotator cuff, they are, they're normal, but they can't work right because they don't have a stable foundation. And if we stabilize that, then those muscles hopefully will work well. We can try physical therapy. There's a lot of information on things you can do to try to preserve this as best as possible. But oftentimes it gets to the point where, again, if you can't raise your arms above shoulder level, it's really debilitating in terms of daily life and activities. It's important to recognize, however, that when you have this condition, if you can't raise your arm up above shoulder level actively, you can throw your arm up all the way to the ceiling, or you can lay down flat and put your arm into a normal position. If we stabilize your scapula to the chest wall, at least 25% of that motion is going to go away. And we'll talk about that. But the point is, is that it's very important for me to share with the patients that you're going to lose some of the normal flexibility of the shoulder as a compromise to stabilize the scapula so that you can actively use the arm better. And that's important to know, especially with their arms up and so they can do a little bit above shoulder level, even though it doesn't have a lot of strength to it. And I don't want them to be frustrated that they can't go to the same level, even though before they couldn't lift a five or 10 pound object up to the shoulder level or above, but now they can with no difficulty. So we have to make sure that expectations are very clear. Can you raise your arms up to and the ceiling? The, again, that's the young man we saw okay. before. And then we're just gonna look at him from the side here. I was like this, so. And uh, we do a physical examination. So not only do we do an active movement, but I also test the muscles by acting, asking him to push out. So again, he's showing me is actually his rotator cuff is working just fine. And that if we use his arms down by the side, he does well. Uh, but again, as you see here, as he tries to get his arm up, the scapula is unstable and therefore the, it doesn't work well. But he's got a good rotator cuff, he's got a good deltoid, and if we can make that scapula stable, we're okay. There are other types of scapular winging. This is a young lady who has it on one side. She has a neurologic injury to the nerve to the serratus anterior. This is a young man who had a separation of the clavicle and the scapula that was very severe. And so he's developed scapular winging. In these cases, uh, we do not do a formal scapular fusion. We do a operation that can help transfer muscles to the scapula to assist the rest of the muscles. Why is it different? Because here, there's a small area that's affected, and if we use another muscle tendon unit, we can get this to work, and it's not progressive. With FSHD, it's going to be progressively worse for that serratus anterior to it doesn't work at all, and if we do a muscle transfer, it may last for a year or two, but then it will go on and fail and not have the ability to stabilize the shoulder. So we do look for other things like a unilateral one-sided nerve injury. Here's an example. There are some other unusual things that uh, can uh, cause this also. Uh, here's a young man with a very severe condition. Here's an example of what can happen with and without a fusion. And again, you see it's, his right arm is not normal, but look what he can do, but he can't do any of those things unless he has the tricks to be able to move his arm. And again, this is a very severe condition, but this is just an example of how this can actually work well. So you can see actively raises up his arm, which he cannot do on the other side. He has to throw his arm up uh, to get it in that area. So this is uh, remarkably, uh, despite you see how severe this is, this has been a great uh, addition to his ability to do the things that he needs to do. And raise your arms up straight up in front of you. Good. Again, here's another example of that where we were looking at them before surgery. We've marked the arms so we're sure of the right side, the correct side, because both sides can be affected and we're getting ready to do the surgery. We do take x-rays to make sure everything's okay. We have to check the pulmonary function and we have to ask about anesthesia. We have to look for a variety of unusual conditions. Here's a person where I did this fusion on that had a gunshot wound that took out all the muscles. So there are other reasons why we do these things, but they're really quite rare. There are a number of anesthesia concerns. Um, in the beginning, when we started doing this 25 years ago, there's a condition called malignant hyperthermia, where there a, a, the anesthesia sets off a cascade of events that affects the calcium channels. That is typical of what happens with Duchenne's or Becker's, but it's not FSHD. And we wrote a paper about this because there were people with FSHD who were being denied surgery that would be helpful for their quality of life 
but people said, well, it's elective and you have a condition, you have a risk of a condition that's fatal, so we don't recommend it. Two things have changed that. One, we know with FSHD, the risk of malignant hypothermia is the same as the normal population. And two, the anesthesiologists now have a better method of treating this, even though it's still very, very dangerous, and they have the medicine available just to hedge their bet, just in case. But I can tell you, I've never had a patient that we've operated have malignant hypothermia uh, with FSHD. So I, I really believe it's the same incidence as the normal population. Uh, and while, and if you have find an anesthesiologist that doesn't believe that, they can call me, I'm happy to speak to them, uh, or we can talk with another anesthesiologist. Scapular thoracic stabilization has been around for a while. There's a lot of different ways that people have done this around the world. One of the ways was taking out some of the ribs. Others was putting bone grafts on it, as you see here from people from England. This is the way that Dr. Bunch and Siegel did it, where they wired it in a couple of places along the ribs onto the uh, scapula. And that actually worked very well. You can see 12 patients, uh, seven which had bilaterally and the results were significantly improved, although one patient did have a major injury to the nerve of their shoulder. I started back in 1994 in my own personal practice to do about four cases a year, sometimes six cases, and we've done up now over 100 cases over the past almost 30 years. That's not a lot, and I, I realize I wish, you know, I'm sure most patients are thinking, well, I wish I had a doctor that did a lot more. Good luck finding one. There's not a lot of these that are being done around the world, and so, uh, I've had patients from many different parts of the world. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that much of the skill or technology that we use, we use in other parts of orthopedic surgery. So it's not like this is a new operation every time we do it. You just have to have enough experience at this, done it enough times, you have a systematic way of managing it and the operation can be very, very safe. We've been fortunate, they've all healed. We had one patient who did have a brachioplexopathy very early on in the series, in fact, the, it was so early that the paper by Bunch had not been written. We had to release that nerve to get improvement with that. And what we've learned is all of our patients are now monitored at the time of surgery by a neurologic technician to make sure the nerves don't get squeezed. Now I'm gonna go through the surgical technique and there are some interoperative photographs here. If that bothers you, you may wanna turn away from the screen a little bit, but I think it's important you just understand what we're doing. We put the a patient in the prone or the lying flat face down position. We have to get to the crest of the hip on the back. We have to go to the shoulder blade. We have to expose rib three, four, five, and six. And uh, we have to have special ways to fix that into place. So those are the two areas we operate. We make sure we put some compression stockings on their legs. We draw out the outline. So that helps to make sure that we're preparing the area of the site, keeping everything sterile and clean and make sure we have plenty of room to do this. We draw this out even before the surgery so that everybody knows exactly what's going on. The anesthesiologist and everybody else uh, can prepare for, the, for what we're doing for the case. Our doctor wants us to. And then, so, and then here's what that looks like. So everything's covered up. We've got the uh, stand there and we've got full exposure from the lower part of the neck all the way to the upper part of the buttocks to be able to do the surgery. It's a general anesthesia, which means you go completely asleep. They do use a special type of anesthesia to again, prevent malignant hyperthermia. We do inject the skin and we inject the area around the nerves to help people out. And this is just an example of what this looks like. You wanna see the entire procedure, you can go online. Uh, I have a YouTube site uh, that shows that. I didn't wanna go through all the details, but again, this is what, what they look like. Here's the scapula here. Here's a plate that goes over the top of the scapula. We're passing the wires and the ribs are underneath this and we'll show you that a little bit better. So here's an example, ribs three, four, five, and then six will be down here. I pulled the scapula out of the way. This incision looks huge, but it's a straight incision that we just open up to be able to do our operation. And that's the edge of the scapula here. This is looking underneath there. And, and what we have to do is uh, We've got to prepare this and clean this all up so we make sure that we can see everything nice and good. We pass the wires. This is what we've done in the past. We passed wires today. We've gotten away from using wires just in the last couple of years and I'll show you why. It's not it's a negative thing. We've just learned some new technology that may be a little bit nicer. It's a little bit more user friendly than these wires. You had to, this is a special technique and how you actually tighten them down. So uh, many of the younger surgeons have never had to use wires and probably uh, would be a bit of a challenge, but we did this for, for really more than 20 years and it worked great. 
There now is this device that has a, a tape. It's about two millimeters in thickness. And when we wrap it twice, it's actually stronger than the metal wire. And the advantage to that is we can actually tension this much, much tighter than we can with the wire. That's an advantage and a disadvantage. I had one patient sent to me who had the wires tightened so tight that it actually cut through all four of the ribs. And that's, that's a big problem. So you have to be careful about that. We take the bone from the crest. It doesn't stop people from walking, but they are sore for at least a few days to a couple of weeks. We cover the dressing with a special dressing that can stay on so you don't have to have multiple dressings at the time. We don't use staples. And this is what it looks like when we're done with the plate and the wires, as you see here. We put people in an immobilization brace because the weight of gravity pulls down on the arm and it can lower the scapula or tilt it downwards, which would then restrict your ability to raise your arm up. Uh, from the maximum amount that we're trying to achieve. We do put this in a slight amount of what we call angulation, so we can get elevation to at least, if it's 90 degrees level with the floor, we like to get at least 120 or above, and we make sure this is fit well. And then we start therapy around six weeks. In the days, uh, 20 years ago, they used to pe put people in casts for up to three months, and just the mobilization alone for three months, it would take up to a year to get the strength back. So we really wanna get people fused and moving as quickly as possible. So at six weeks, they're out of the brace, they're doing exercises, the therapist is helping them, we're working on the rotator cuff, and we're trying Go to get all these things done. To the so this is that young man we saw in the beginning, and, and you can see here, uh, this is what his video was. And then I happened to be at a meeting in Orlando, close to where he lives, and this is what he can do now. So he's gonna show us what he can do with his shoulders. So you can't even tell which side is fused, but it is his right side. And uh, he's done very well. He can use his arms. He went back to being a police officer. He stays in the office and he doesn't have to be involved in altercations, but he's extremely happy with the results of his surgery. It's given Go ahead him a and raise your arms straight up to the ceiling. So that's been helpful. Here's another young lady um, who had this surgery. Uh, she's in her uh, uh, late twenties. And, uh, and again, the ability to be able to raise up the arms above shoulder level, she's gonna show us here. And these are things that she just couldn't do before. She'd have to throw her arms up or whatever. That's after the bilateral fusion. So both sides have been done and you see the kind of motion that's still preserved even with that. Here's another example. Uh, and again, one side still affected. This is an older gentleman that had the surgery uh, and yet still got a pretty good result out of it. When we actually tested patients and saw what we could see is they could reach their mouth, they can reach uh, their back pocket, they could provide personal care, tuck in their shirt, reach their opposite side, and comb their hair normally more than two out of three patients. And this was a significant improvement uh, from what they could do before. The strength, we haven't done a really good job of measuring that, but I've had people call me and thankful because they've been able to do yard work, moving railroad ties, uh, play golf, like carpentry. I don't put restrictions on people. I just say, if you're going to do more strenuous things, work your way into it. Don't just jump right into the hardest thing. The results today, you know, in terms of things is that we, we it's about a three day hospitalization. Some people go home in two. We've had one major complication was now more than 15 years ago. And we do everything we can to protect that. There's a couple of things. One is that we very careful with certain kind of deformity. And two, at the time of surgery, we actually look at the nerves. And if we see the nerve signal change during surgery, I sometimes have to move the scapula up. So instead of ribs three, four, five, and six, we have to go up to two, three, four, five. And by raising it up, it keeps the space open and takes the pressure off the nerve. And then I've had two patients come back because they have a curve in their spine, scoliosis. Even though the fusion was great, they're doing well, the scapula was sticking out a little bit at the bottom and that was bothering them every time they hit a chair and we would just go in and trim off. It was an, essentially an outpatient procedure. They came in and went home the same day, just trimmed off uh, that corner of the scapula. We've been very fortunate. I have not had to reoperate on any patient that we have uh, performed a fusion on for FSHD. It's not the case for some of the more unusual neurologic injuries or traumatic injuries like car accidents, but for FSHD, the fusion rate is really quite good. And I, we, don't, we are not aware of any patients that are taking medications on a regular basis long after the surgery. The shoulder motion has improved anywhere from 30 to 60 degrees, about an average about 45 degrees above with active motion. Internal rotation, reaching behind your back is very good. External rotation or rotating out is a little bit more affected by that. 
We now, again, try our very best. Instead of using wires, we use the tape. And so you wouldn't even see those little thin dark lines there. I think it's a very safe operation. I think the indications are for those individuals who cannot really use their arms anymore at shoulder level or above. And that becomes very debilitating in terms of everyday activities. Uh, the average age of the patient is somewhere between uh, the age of about 17 and 25. We've gone as young as 12, almost 13 years old, so 12 uh, plus, uh, which was a little scary. She was a very, very mature, developed individual. Her mother had had bilateral scapular thoracic stabilization. She handled it extremely well, very maturely, and actually came back for the second site and has done remarkably well. Our oldest patient is in the 50s. And it was a big struggle, hard to breathe, more painful. Uh, it was just a, a, a bigger uh, hit uh, to an older uh, person than it is to our young patients. It can be effective for motion, strength, and activities of daily living, and really valuable in terms of independence. So I think it has a place. It's not for everyone, but I think we've done a lot of things to really make this a safe operation for those individuals where it can actually improve their quality of life. If you'd like a little bit more information, of course, please go to the FSHD Society website. My website is www.anthonyromeomd.com, and we have some more information. You can also find uh, my office. Uh, there's a place to leave questions, and so we can try to answer your questions. And I am uh, pretty well involved with social media, too, so uh, if you have connections on uh, that we can connect and I can answer more of your questions. But thank you very much for the opportunity and I hope that was helpful in defining where we're at with regards to uh, scapular stabilization in 2020. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was incredibly informative. Uh, so we have some questions coming in. Um, I think the first of these, I think you answered during your talk about uh, whether you test for brachial plexus injuries during surgery. So, yeah. So uh, the the what happens is if you if you look right here, I'm kind of pointing the clavicle, which is our collarbone. When we uh, when when you have this condition, what happens is that especially when they're younger, is the scapula doesn't descend all the way down uh, when and and get its full growth in some of our patients. And if we take and bring it down a little further and put it to the scalp, it actually pulls the clavicle back. Well, right behind the clavicle is the nerves that go down into the arm. And that area is called the thoracic outlet. And so if we squeeze it too much, the nerves will get squeezed and there's a problem. And so during the surgery, we actually have little monitors where they put little probes up around the neck area to, to have the top part of the nerve all the way into the fingertips. And when I go to fuse this, we, once we're done, we wait about, we're still doing some things and stuff, but I asked specifically at that time for the neurologic technician, please analyze this very carefully over the next 10 to 15 minutes. And if there's no signal change, we're great. But if there's any signal change at all, then we're gonna have to change our position. And, and what we have to do is we have to bring it up a little bit, which then pulls the clavicle away from the ribs and gives a space. So it's a really critical and I think essential part of the surgery if you're gonna do this safely in patients. Great, thank you. We have a question uh, about um, if there have been any deaths or significant injuries, what is the success rate of the surgery and how is the recovery in general? A lot of three questions in there. So um, the most severe complication of any medical intervention would be death. I'm unaware uh, of, of, of any reports regarding death with this operation. Um, in my practice, that's never happened. Um, there are some places around the world where the cardiothoracic surgeons will actually do both sides at the same time. And so what they do is they actually, uh, the, the, the lingo is we drop the lung, we reduce the size of the lung, they go relatively quickly and they fuse both of them at the same time and patients wake up with a chest tube in both sides of their chest. And that is a, a very, very um, challenging uh, recovery. And there have been some people who have gotten very sick. I did have one patient and, and she was in her mid thirties who did develop a pneumonia and got very sick and had to go to the ICU for IV antibiotics for her pneumonia. And that's because, um, the reason why is because uh, she was unable to, to breathe. What we try to do, and that's because it hurt. 
So what we try to do, once the fusion's in place, I actually take local anesthetic and put it right at the nerves along the ribs, three, four, five, and six, so that the patients don't feel the operation for at least six, eight hours after surgery. And that's usually enough time for them to reestablish taking deep breaths. And by doing that, your lungs open up again, and it really has reduced our risk of pneumonia. So that's the main thing. Uh, and again, people go home uh, to their house. They don't have to go to extended care. In terms of, uh, we already talked about the nerve injury. In terms of lack of fusion, we have not had them. They may occur, and I know they've been reported, but it seems to be relatively rare with this condition. And then the last thing is like, how do people do in general? Well, that was sort of my last slide. Um, in general, they're not taking any medications. Their scapula is stable. So that's nice just in terms of positioning and cosmesis. And instead of only going to 90 degrees, they typically go to no less than 120 to up to about what we say about 140. As you saw, the lady that had it done bilaterally uh, with a bend in her spine a little bit, she's able to get her arms up here, which is remarkably different than here. Being able to wash your hair, reaching into the first level cabinet and doing that with power. So you can grab a book or a large plate and put it here with power. Uh, that's a big difference. So. Uh, my, my experience has been the vast majority of patients that have it done on one side will come back within two years and have it done on the other side because they're so pleased with the improvement and the function of their, of their operative side. Great. Thank you. How long does it take for people to recover from the surgery and what kind of um, nursing or home care, family support uh, do they need, you know, so in terms sure. of... Yeah, so as you saw, we put them in a brace. And so that is kind of cumbersome. Um, we do, I do allow them to come out of the brace. I think it's easier to bathe sitting. So if they're going to be in the shower, I recommend like a plastic, stable plastic chair or, or a picnic type chair that can get wet and have them sit down, take the brace off and let their arms sit in their lap so they're supported. And then they can shower up and clean up and that's perfectly fine. You saw we have these special types of dressings now that actually are waterproof. So we do that within about three, well, they go home usually at three days. And so the next one or two days they can actually it's, get it wet. I don't want them to soak that area, but they can wash their hair and let water run down and just pat that area. Their family member really is just helping them because they have only one arm to, to bathe with. Um, there's not a problem uh, with toileting uh, in general. Uh, there's not a problem with eating. They can use their opposite side. If someone has severe uh, symptoms on the opposite side, then they may need a little bit more support uh, for these daily activities. But remarkably, um, as I said, many of them are young uh, individuals. They bounce back pretty quickly and within uh, five to seven days are fairly independent, even with um, their, their getting dressed. You have to use a little bit baggier clothing and things like that. At six weeks, they come out of the brace. I've had some of my young teenagers literally come in with the brace in their hand because around four weeks, they felt so good and they didn't want to wear it anymore. I don't recommend that, but that's, <laughs> it's hard sometimes to, to direct teenagers and I get that. Um, and, um, and so usually we say six weeks, they come out and they can start moving uh, that side, the surgical side right away. We send them to therapy to work on just gentle flexibility exercises. And after two to four weeks, we then start some light strengthening below shoulder level, working on the rotator cuff, and then gradually above. At three months, we are more aggressive with the strengthening program. And I tell individuals that for everyday life activities, somewhere between three or four months, you can do all of it without difficulty. You'll still have a weakness trying to wash your hair or reach in that first cabinet, but that's, that'll get better. By six months, they can do all of those things. The maximum recovery that allows them to do things like yard work um, and, and some of these other light sports and things usually takes nine months to a year. And that's pretty typical of most orthopedic surgeries. You know, we oftentimes hear people say that they get better in six months and, and sure they are. But if you really ask them, are you back to the same level that you were or the level that you can be, even with our high level athletes uh, to get back to the same level they were, it usually takes nine months to a year. And it's no difference with this. So we I tell people that they really should figure out a routine exercise program uh, that they follow on a regular basis for the first year to maximize the final result of the use of their arm. Right, okay, thank you. Since there are not very many surgeons who have experience 
doing this procedure for FSHD patients. We know that some patients will travel to have uh, the surgery done. Um, how long, how, how soon after the surgery can they travel home? That's something I was wondering. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, we, we try to do our best to accommodate those things. If we, uh, some people like to come in and discuss and then go home and think about it, which is perfectly fine. Uh, we've had others who have made the decision they want to have it done and they've talked to someone I've operated on it and, and they want me to do it. So I'll have them come in the day before surgery so that we can meet and talk. And I go over the things that I just presented. So we're all on the same page. And if they have family members there, we, we answer all those questions. And then we do the surgery on the next day. And I tell them it's a three day recovery. So if, let's say that we saw them on Monday and we did the surgery on Tuesday. It's likely they're gonna go home by Friday. They should go home by Friday, but they may even go home by Thursday or on the, on the second post-operative day, some. And so I tell them that uh, in an ideal environment, if they're traveling, it's probably a good idea to spend one night in a hotel or with their family in the community and then take a flight out on, on Saturday. Uh, that's, that's being conservative and being sensitive to the fact that everybody sort of tolerates surgery a little bit differently. Um, there's a number of our patients probably who could uh, leave the hospital Thursday or Friday and take a flight later that day and go home. They're not gonna be perfectly comfortable, uh, but, they, but they would be able to do that. Traveling, I'd really like them not to drive more than three hours. It's just not really a good idea in terms of worrying about things like your legs and breathing and everything else. So if, if they're going to travel, again, we wait until that uh, either Friday or Saturday to do that. And uh, we've had international patients come in and go home on the weekend with the same type of routine. That, that's amazing. Uh, we have a question from a gentleman who says, um, he cannot raise his arms above the shoulder line. I'm 1.86 meters tall, I weigh 100 kilos, and I have 90 centimeters of heavy and strong arm. He's wondering, it wouldn't lifting his arms if he had the surgery damage the rib cage due to the pressure and weight of my upper limbs? That, that is a concern, but once the bones fuse, then again, that's why I say if, if you're going to be more strenuous or you're a, a bigger person, you, as you go through the adaptive phases uh, after six months up to nine months to a year, the fusion mass becomes more, has strength to it. Bone responds to stress, and so it will also thicken. I've had some patients who, uh, I remember one in particular who had a, a great fusion and did well about six months, and then he called me uh, uh, about one year saying that I, I know I messed it up. Yesterday I was moving railroad ties in my yard and, and I was doing it all day and I hadn't done it you know, since before my surgery and, and this things felt so great, I couldn't stop. And now I can't move my arms and my chest is killing me and everything else. And we got x-rays and the fusion was fine. He just overdid his muscles and he probably did put a lot of stress on his rib cage, uh, but the ribs are fairly flexible and respond pretty well to stress and they will get stronger over time. So it's been remarkable, but we have not seen people come in with like late rib fractures or the fusion coming apart once it, it, once it heals. Um, and so that's, that's been very uh, uh, beneficial for people, even when they try to do strenuous things, but you kind of have to work your way up to it because we're essentially creating a new bone that you didn't have before, which includes your scapula and your ribs. And so it needs to get some steady stress and steadily more and more stress so it thickens and hardens and can handle uh, either a, a heavier arm or heavier activities. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a question from a patient wondering if they undergo this procedure, can it help prevent or reduce um, lordosis? She asked, but I, I guess she's maybe part of that thinking there is that the spine may be deformed by a muscle weakness. The, the, so. As far as we can tell, the two are not um, integrated. So you can still have the development over time of, of some changes in your spine. Um, it is believed that if you have a bilateral fusion uh, for the right indications and you have some scoliosis, by stabilizing the ribs on both sides and not allowing them to rotate or move, you may reduce the incidence of scoliosis or, or, or 
you know, lordosis is, is in the front to back plane. Scoliosis is not, not only a bend, but a twist. Mm -hmm. And by fusing both sides, you may create essentially an internal brace that may limit that. But um, we do have patients who have the fusion and then later on in life will, will develop a little bit more spinal changes because of the muscle imbalance and even maybe possibly the more severe cases go on to requiring support or a wheelchair, even though their scapulas are fused because it's not entirely uh, um, interrelated between the two problems. Um, it's a question wondering if you have performed this surgery in people who have more severe, like uh, if they're say a full-time wheelchair user, but maybe they still have adequate strength in the upper body. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question because you can imagine the way the world changes if you're using a wheelchair. And then on top of that, you can't get your arms above shoulder level. So you've really limited uh, access to many, many parts of the world. The truth of the matter is, is that usually when those patients come in, they are a little older and the severity of the problem of their upper extremities makes it difficult to uh, see that we're gonna make a big difference with the fusion. Many times they not only have uh, the scapula muscle, the serratus is not working, but they may go on to have more of the humeral muscle. So their biceps may be severely atrophied. And the problem with that is, is that if your biceps is atrophied, you can't flex your arm up. Even when you get your arm up higher, it, it becomes floppy. And so since the purpose of the shoulder is to position the hand in space and the biceps also plays a role in that, if, the, if you have muscular weakness that goes further on down your arm, which is what we see in a number of individuals as they progress through life, then the ability to position your hand is reduced and therefore the, um, the benefit of the surgery is reduced too. I, I go over that with patients and I would say that many times um, it's difficult to say there's gonna be a dramatic change uh, in their quality of life and they opt not to go ahead with the surgery. We had some of our older patients do that. Um, even those who have gotten to the point where they're using a walker or early stages of a wheelchair, but, and as you say, that they really actually have pretty good arm muscles, but that's a really a rare situation. You have to be very careful uh, to not oversell the, the amount of functional improvement um, in that patient. Mm -hmm. In addition to what you just mentioned, are there other uh, considerations that might rule this surgery out for an FSHD patient? The, you know, I think if, um, if there's other, so first of all, what we call comorbidities or other problems or medical problems. So if there's a pulmonary problem, if there's a lung problem, uh, that can rule the surgery out. When we take out the ribs, when we fuse the ribs and we take out their ability to expand and contract as we breathe, we actually restrict the amount of air that can come into the lungs. And if they have a, a lung problem before the surgery, that may be worsened uh, by the inability to open up their rib cage the way they could before surgery. So our patients do get pulmonary function tests before surgery to ensure there's enough what we call reserve room as we take some of that away, that they still have plenty left that they can uh, uh, exchange air and breathe pretty well. So I think the main thing is the, the lung problem. Uh, there may be cardiac or heart problems, but that's pretty unusual to be honest with you. Um, we've had some patients that have had very, very small scapulas when it affects early, but we've still been able to make that work. That was one, things that, uh, one of the things that were considered a contraindication, but we've been able to succeed. Sometimes we can only use three ribs instead of four in that situation. But I, I can't think of much else than that that affects patients uh, specifically with uh, FSHD. There's a question, uh, would you recommend this? It's hard to say, I guess, without examining the patient, but it's a 40 year old woman with mild winging on one arm. Does she sound like she potentially is a candidate or she could, could be evaluated? So, uh, yeah, I, I think potentially she's a candidate, but I, I think that in the office, we would go over what the improvements would be. And if it truly is mild, I, I think she probably at age 40 has learned to adapt uh, to the way her movement and her strength is in a way that if we take away about 25% of that movement, she, she may not be very happy about that. Um, it may be nice to do some things like yoga or 
swimming and even though she doesn't have the strength, she likes the flexibility of movement. And we do have to tighten that down or take away some of the motion. And so I, I actually, the way I do that is in the office, I will take my hand and it's a little bit uncomfortable, but I'll squeeze as tight as I can with the scapula in the front of their chest wall. And I'll show them what their movement would be like. And then say, is that enough of a difference in your daily life that, that, that really helps you out? And again, I think it's, it's, um, it, it's by 40, there's been so many things that have been figured out that um, uh, it really is um, not, it, 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 there's, there's two parts of it. One is the functional part, but the other thing is concerning is cosmetic. And, and the reason why is because the scapula is over the front and tilted down. So I don't know if I can show you my shoulders, but instead of having your shoulder like this, it's kind of, you know, this downward sloping thing. And that bothers some people and their clothing and that it, it takes away what they think is some of their daily function. So if we can get the scapula back and more of a standard posture, uh, that's a, that's a, I would say that's a relative uh, part of the indication for the surgery, but we try not to do this for cosmetic reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think you alluded before to people who've had it done on both sides. I mean, what is the uh, sort of minimum time of separation between the having the two procedures? So there, as I mentioned, there are some doctors that will do it. Uh, none that I know of in the United States, but there may be. Uh, but there are some doctors that uh, around the world that will do this at the same time. Uh, I have done it as early as three months. Why? Uh, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you, insurance. And um, I, I think you should wait probably six months. Um, when I say why was it insurance is because they had the first one done sometime in June, July, August. And so their deductible was done and they wanted to have it done before the beginning of the next year uh, to avoid the added expense of a high deductible and they were healthy young people. But I can tell you, that's a real struggle because they haven't completely gotten all of their breathing back to the same level. And then you affect the other side. And I had one young man who just felt like he was short of breath. And really for almost six weeks, uh, he just felt he was fine. We had to check his uh, pulse oximeter and, his, and, and all of that was fine, but it just was hard for him to breathe. And somewhere around six months that goes away. I would say what is oftentimes typical, because again, because of the age group of uh, the patients are typical, many of them are in an educational process, is we oftentimes do one, one summer and do the next one the next summer. And that's a very easy separation of around one year. I think once we get less than six months, we put a lot of stress on the, the pulmonary or breathing system. And we have to be very careful uh, that they're in perfect health to be able to get through that okay. Since you mentioned insurance, I think a lot of patients have a question about the average cost of the yep. surgery. <laughs> is there a ballpark? <laughs> so this is a, you know, this is a, a, it's a great question. And the answer is, is that there is no average cost. And um, in certain parts of the country, I was just in New York, a third or more of the patients are used to uh, getting what we call out of network fees. And an out-of-network fee for this operation can be anywhere from $10,000 to $15,000. If you use the code that's specific to shoulder fusion and you use Medicare guidelines, uh, the amount is under $3,000, but it's covered by your insurance. Um, and so I think that what we try to do is we try to work with you. Uh, what I try to do is try to work with you and make sure it's covered by your insurance. If it is, uh, we go ahead and take care of it. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm sure that if we um, tried to do this in a, in a business-like manner and said for the amount of time and effort that put into it, the amount you get paid, you would say, I would rather do rotator cuff surgery or, uh, or other things. But uh, this has really been sort of a dedication uh, towards the community, the FSHD people. So we in my practice, we just make it happen and we figure it out how it works with your insurance. If you don't have insurance at all, uh, that makes it a little bit more difficult because uh, I'll be honest with you, it's really expensive in the hospital. You really should have insurance at least to cover the facility uh, that you're in to be able to have the procedure. But from my perspective, uh, we try to do it within the patient's insurance coverage. Thank you so much. A uh, question about, um during the recovery post-surgery, you know, if the arm is immobilized, 
uh, would there be concern about atrophy through lo lack of use? And with FSHD, it's always you know, a little harder to recover from muscle atrophy. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why we moved. When I first learned how to do this in Seattle in 1992 and 93, we immobilized the patients for up to three months and it took up to a year for them to get their strength back. And, then, uh, and, and that was kind of what the precedence was. So that's why we're being very safe about the fusion because even when you look at the fusion at six weeks, it's not completely fused, it's not one bone. You can still see the separation between the ribs and the scapula, but it's all filled in around it with a fuzzy uh, pattern of what we call a, a, a fluffy or cloud-like pattern on the x-ray consistent with the bone that's uh, maturing and becoming a fusion mass. And so I, I, I felt that the uh, amount of atrophy and the time it took to get back was so substantial that we moved to six weeks and followed our patients very carefully. Number one, we did not see any increase in, in the risk of the fusion coming apart. So that's very, very important. And number two, uh, it is a much better recovery. So uh, in terms of being able to get the the elbow and the arm working again. Immobilizing patients with FSHD is really, as you all know, not a good idea. And even in the brace, I will have their arm supported. I let them uh, use a ball to squeeze their hand. I let them move their elbow up and down, uh, turn their forearm up and down to at least get the muscles of the hand, the wrist and the elbow working again and doing some activities to try to minimize that risk of, of uh, post-surgical and immobilization atrophy uh, that was asked about. That's a real entity, and it's very important to try to get the mobility going as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Can you take the brace off while you're sleeping, or is there a particular way you need to sleep? Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, I, I tell the patients no. Um, and the reason why is because uh, I, I really think that uh, many people don't realize how much movement occurs when they sleep and rolling from side to side and, and things like that. So I, 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 know, I know it's a really unfortunate and uncomfortable way. So we tell patients to use either three pillows or a lazy, bear, a lazy boy recliner or one of those uh, more sturdy pillows so they're in about a 45 degree upright condition, uh, which is a little bit easier to tolerate the brace than laying down flat. Uh, but I really recommend they stay in the brace during their sleep because they're essentially unconscious and movement can happen and they may twist or turn in a certain way uh, that may in fact uh, be a risk to the fusion mass. So that's what we recommend. I understand it's conservative and some people may not follow it, but uh, you know, the, a huge commitment has been made to do this operation. And um, while it's not a great way to sleep for six weeks, I, I think it's worth the effort just to make sure we don't have to go back in and redo it. So uh, a couple more questions. We're about out of time, but there's so many questions here. Uh, people want to know, uh, is the procedure reversible and would there ever be a reason to reverse the procedure? The procedure is not reversible. Uh, that's very important. And I tell the patients up front, um, you, you, once you take out the muscle that holds the scapula against the chest wall, so that you can then put the two bones together. Uh, if you were to go back in and, and cut through that bone and let it go free, it wouldn't have any function. You'd go back to a patient who has the, um, that unstable pattern that you saw. What I have done, very, very, very few people in the world have done this, is I have had patients come to me who had it fused in a bad position. And so, I wouldn't say it's reversible, but it is revisable. So it's a, it's a delicate operation. It's more dangerous. We take all the same precautions, but I literally have to take a device which is called a chisel. It's a sharp cutting uh, device that cuts through bone like a sculptor uses on a marble. And I have to find the ribs close to the spine so I know where the normal rib is. And I literally have to tap, 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 and basically carve through that bone mass uh, through those ribs until I can get the scapula to separate from the ribs. And then I have to clean that out and then I have to put it in a better position. The most common um, uh, problem has been the scapula is either put out too far wide because when the patient was laying down flat, they let the arms come too far forward. So then they're, they're here so they can't get their arms up. 
uh, or the scapula wasn't put in a good position so it's tilted way down so they can't raise up their arm anyways. Mm -hmm. And so what I have to do is again, chisel that off and then take the scapulates here and we have to bring it back and then up like that to put it in the right position to make it work. And so I have had to do that a few times. Um, and so I would say the operation is not reversible, but you can revise it and make it better if the position that it was fused in is not helpful for a function. Great, thank you. So uh, if patients come from out of state, um, how does the follow-up care work? Uh, you know, that's, um, uh, you know, we've learned a lot actually in the last six months uh, with managing patients through the pandemic. And so we really embrace telemedicine. What, what I like to do is the first post-operative visit, if they come from somewhere else, oftentimes they're referred from a physician in that area. And so I try to communicate with that physician ahead of time and ask them if they'd be uh, willing to see the patient at about 10 to 14 days after the operation, just take some standard chest X-rays just to make sure everything's okay. Um, and generally speaking, that's not been an issue. Even internationally, uh, we've been able to make that work when people go home uh, to their countries. Now with the technology we have of communicating with everyone. At six weeks, um, I personally like to see the patient. Um, and the reason why is because we're making the decision, is the fusion good? And can they start moving? And I think the, the, the people that are taking care of them oftentimes are uncomfortable with that responsibility um, and, and so I, I suggest to the patient that it, it would be best to come back and see me. Not everyone does. And so what we do is that we have them have x-rays with their physician, and then I have them do a telemedicine call. We have them uh, call in and I, I have them um, show me their incisions and I have them move their arm and I look at the x-rays. And if everything looks acceptable, then we'd let them go ahead and move. So we we can make it work now just about any way possible. I do like the added comfort from both the patient and myself of seeing them at six weeks as a, such a critical point. But even then, um, uh, we were able to, to manage that by telemedicine or telehealth if that's uh, in the best interest of the patient and their family. I'm glad you mentioned telemedicine because that was my next question, which is, um, can you have you screened patients ahead of time to see if they're even a candidate so they don't go, you know, fly and make an overnight trip to sh Chicago just to find out they're not a candidate? I mean, is there any pre-screening that can be done via telemedicine? I think, um, honestly, I think that's something that we've um, been working on developing just in the last six months. I, I didn't do that before. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like telemedicine. I think it's valuable, uh, but I've always believed that if you're gonna have someone operate on you, you have to really trust that person. And I probably, maybe it's old school, uh, but I like to be face to face with the person. And I've always felt that that's best uh, for the patient too. So I, I, I if the patient's gonna be okay, uh, having a telemedicine visit to determine whether that's even possible or not, I'm more than happy to do that. And we now have the capacity to do that uh, in a much better way. In the past, it's been a concern that I, I just wouldn't want to be operating on someone if I really didn't have a chance to develop a, a trusting relationship, which I think has to be done, even in today's world, is better to be done face-to-face. -face. That's my own personal belief, and I think probably um, that's not entirely true anymore based on what we've learned uh, from uh, the last six months, and so we probably will soften that up a little bit as we go forward. Mm -hmm. um, almost the last question. How long... Um, after the surgery, can someone get back to doing things like sports, I mean, surfing and ice hockey? <laughs> once yeah, I mentioned. six months. I think most people by six months are, have the capacity to participate, but it will take up to nine months to a year before. And, and you know, I, I, it's common sense. I would say you should play in a no-check league with hockey. Um, and I know no-check leagues still have contact. We all know, know that. But I, I would say, you know, it's not in your best interest. You, you could you could fracture your scapula. You could, you could do something else. So it's, it's not like um, it's just the, the fusion will come apart, which we haven't seen, but there's other things that could be injured because you have such a rigid fixation there. Surfing is the same thing. I, I think that if people are excellent or very good surfers before and they know the water well and they know the, the places that they're surfing, so there's not a chance that they're gonna get a big wave that's gonna dump them into the ground, um, you know, that's, that's fine. So I, 
you know, we can't uh, put people in a bubble, uh, but we do recommend that they participate in activities where there's not going to be a collision either with another person or another surface uh, as a way to potentially avoid uh, a significant problem with the fusion. Well, is the fusion itself prone to damage if someone has a fall? Any no, it's not. It's the ribs. Uh, actually, the bone of the scapula and the ribs become so solid, they can fracture the ribs, which is can be a really, really painful uh, experience and may not heal like a normal rib fracture because you've got a fracture and then you've got the weight of the entire arm on the other side of the fracture because of the fusion. And so that may require to go in and actually uh, do a, a surgical fixation of the ribs if you have to. So, but to be honest with you, we, we really, with patients with FSHD, as far as we know, we have not had a patient who has a complete fusion that's been documented by x-rays that then had an event where that fusion came apart later. Um, question, are you still performing surgeries during the pandemic? So the, uh, the pandemic, yes, is ongoing. Um, the indications for surgery uh, were varied depending on the prevalence of the infection in your community. And we, I wrote a paper on that in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery on what were considered emergency or urgency or elective procedures. And when the disease and infection rate was very high in the community, we did not do any elective procedures. And this is considered an elective procedure. In addition, you would want to avoid surgeries that might affect the same area of the body that this virus affects, which is your respiratory system. So this would be very, very, very low on the list if you have uh, a presence of the, of the virus on a high basis uh, in your community. Um, now that it's uh, a much better controlled, not completely controlled by any stretch of the imagination, we do screen. We make sure that everyone gets a COVID-19 test, uh, ideally within uh, 48 to 72 hours before surgery uh, to identify that. Uh, we make sure they have no symptoms. We ask them to quarantine themselves from anyone that might potentially have the illness for at least seven to 10 days before surgery so that they don't have to worry about that. And we tell them after surgery, they really should be very, very strict with social isolation rules and staying away from any potential risk of getting the infection, um, being out in the community or any of those things. So even if your local community is now allowing you to, uh, to go to a variety of different places like restaurants, we would suggest for the first six weeks, don't do any of that because your breathing is not going to be entirely normal. And if you get this virus, it could be incredibly uh, dangerous and, and maybe possibly even lead to a, a fatal event because of what it does to our pulmonary system. So we haven't, of course, heard of anything like that, but that's the potential risk. So I think we have to be very careful and very safe. Uh, the, you know, um, the hospitals have done a great job of, of limiting uh, the concerns regarding this. Uh, we've done a number of things to make our working environment much safer so that you can't have this transmitted um, a lot of people were worried that the transmission was coming from the healthcare workers, but in reality, uh, that's an extremely rare event. The vast majority of healthcare workers that get this illness get it from the patients that are coming in or from the community. Uh, and so uh, healthcare workers in general are very safe and are following all the social isolation guidelines, masking, and even the testing policies to ensure uh, it's as safe as possible. So if a, someone wants to have it done today and you're in an environment where the uh, virus prevalence is low, then I think it's as safe as doing it a, a year from today when the vaccination will be available. If you want to maximize the safety, then I guess you would want to wait until there is a effective vaccination available. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. Well, we've gone a little over time, but we had, that was so informative. I want to turn the um, mic back over to Beth Johnston for some final um, announcements. Thank you, Dr. Romeo. I must say that I think all of your fans were online singing your praises today. Okay. Mike piped in, Vicki with regards to her son piped in, Dave and Katie, um, they all were singing your praises online today. So you definitely have a dedicated following, I must say. <laughs> I, I think you could tell, I, I take this personally. When I, I got involved in this a long time ago, this was not about, you know, being a famous uh, baseball surgeon and fixing elbows that, you know, uh, that will make millions of dollars. This was about taking care of a unique and wonderful patient population that needed help. And so it's become both a personal 
uh, uh, interest and well as a passion of mine to do the best I can. I think that uh, works out well for all of us. Yeah, well, you make that very obvious, so thank you. Um, and thanks to everyone who attended our FSHD University webinar today. Of course, a very special thank you to Dr. Anthony Romeo for taking the time to be with us today and for all of your amazing, excellent, and helpful information. And I must say, Dr. Romeo is actually going to be our guest um, next Wednesday evening on FSHD Society radio show, Wednesday night, um, on Facebook Live with our infamous host, Tim Hollenbach. So you'll have a chance there to continue this conversation about scapular stabilization surgery. So be sure to tune in next Wednesday. Um, our next FSHDU webinar is Thursday, September 17th at the same time. Uh, our guest speaker is Dr. Katherine Wagner, who has seen patients with FSHD for more than 20 years. And she'll be discussing some of the most asked topics about FSHD and of course, answer all of your questions. Be sure to check our website for other upcoming FSHD University events and watch your email as well. Um, I'll actually post a link in the chat to our, that page. Um, and our website is really a great way um, to access a whole library of educational material like um, Dr. Romeo was saying before and event information. So please be sure to take a perusal, fshdsociety.org. All right, thank you again very much for joining us today and we will see you next time. Take care and be safe everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.